Uh, it's a very interesting time for everyone in the United States and arguably the rest of the world, and certainly this is true for academic medical centers. So my, my plan is to quickly go through a little data, uh, importantly a few vignettes to give examples of the kinds of things that go on here, and then uh, leave some time uh, for a couple of questions, and then we'll have a reception afterwards. So I wanted to begin with the economic impact. This is clearly the most important variable in our environment, and I think in many respects, while it's affected a lot of us personally and a lot of people in our community already, uh, the effect on academic medical centers is going to be delayed. And a lot of you may have read uh, today President Beenan's announcement about the state of the university's uh, economy. Uh, those points certainly pertain to the medical school. Uh, you may have also read some of the reports that have come out recently from Yale and the Partners Program, Stanford, Washington University. Uh, at least these are getting passed around in the, in the email. And I think what you can take away from it is that while our endowment has, has declined, and you can predict sort of the amount of decline, it's in the 25 to, to 30 percent range, depending on how they value some of the private equities, we're relatively well off, not so much because our endowment has declined more or less than anyone else. It, it has more to do with the way the expenditures are structured within an organization. And this is partly because we've had limited use of debt uh, for some of our capital pro uh, projects. We've had less reliance on the endowment for uh, liquidity and, and cash flow compared to some other institutions. And this reflects careful planning over over many years and decades. And at least thus far, our clinical volume uh, remains relatively constant. Uh, but we should expect, I think, the possibilities. We've seen in the last few weeks or months that this could even get worse, and we need to prepare ourselves for that possibility. We need to be thinking about the consequences and planning for it. And I think most of you recognize the fact that the way endowments are structured, for example, that they really uh, reflect several years of economic activity uh, prior to the current year. So the payout that we're experiencing now is part of a rolling average of, of previous years. And so the anticipation is that the economic impact from this year uh, is going to be uh, taking place in future years. So all of your department chairs and center directors are working with the uh, budget uh, people at, at the medical school, at the hospital, at the university uh, to work with these uh, challenging issues uh, but it also creates an opportunity, and the opportunity is that as we either are replacing faculty or uh, strategically investing in, in certain areas, that we can be highly selective at a time uh, when other people are even having frank reductions or no ability uh, to grow or replace at the same time. I also want to acknowledge the 14 years of service of President Henry Beenan. Uh, Henry's presidency has been truly remarkable, and not just in the length of service, but I think the effectiveness of his service. Uh, he's been a tremendous fundraiser, as reflected in the capital campaign. Uh, those who have worked with him most closely, I think, realize that he's tireless in this effort and very effective uh, in development, and this has been part of the reason why our endowment has risen so rapidly during his tenure as president. Uh, the royalties that have come in from research, uh, particularly from Lyrica, have also advanced that and, and are a reminder of how our inventiveness and, and innovation can actually uh, support our academic activities more broadly. Uh, he's been very effective in the relationships with the clinical affiliates. Uh, Northwestern Memorial Hospital and, and Children's in particular have quite uh, different relationships and as I'll emphasize, uh, later, the fact that, that Children's Hospital will be moving to this campus is going to fundamentally change for the next 50 years uh, what this medical center campus will look like and how it will operate. Uh, certainly, his standards for hiring, and we shouldn't forget that the new financial model for the medical school was introduced under Henry's leadership, and this has created a, a level of flexibility and innovation that have allowed us uh, to grow as quickly and as effectively as we have. So just to go through uh, a few metrics, you're used to seeing these. Uh, I wanted to show the sponsored project awards by year. Uh, you see this double-digit growth that we've experienced through 
06, 07, and 08. Uh, you can also see this evaluated either per faculty or per uh, square foot. Uh, what I will say, though, is that the data for this year is not so positive. Uh, this will not surprise many of you because of the flat NIH funding, and as we've had awards that are three to five years long, many of those have expired in the last year or two. It's a very challenging environment to either renew those as, as uh, competing grants, or if you have a new grant going in, it goes into a very difficult funding environment. We also were fortunate in the last couple of years to have some very large uh, grants that came in, the Cancer Center Renewal, uh, the Oncofertility uh, Pioneer Award, uh, Wayne Anderson's uh, grant for structural uh, biology, and, and several others that have raised uh, the, the level that we see for 07 and 08. So I'm anticipating the real possibility that the next year uh, may not show this kind of growth and may even be reduced, which in our financial model uh, will lead to less indirect costs that we're able to plow back in uh, to the enterprise as part of our financial model. So the message to those who are involved in, in research is uh, come up with great ideas. Uh, you've got to submit the grants for them to get reviewed and, and accepted. And one of the things that we track, actually, are the numbers of submissions that go in per grant cycle. And it, it's actually lower. Uh, that number of grants going in is proportionately lower uh, to the funding rate. Uh, so for whatever reason, not that many applications are going out. It may be that people realistically you know, sort of have figured out where the set point is for getting funded, uh, but it's something that we'll study carefully and, and report to you uh, as we get more data. Medical school class is, is really fabulous. Uh, we see a continuing increase in the application rate, uh, the grade point average of the class, their MCAT scores, you know, all of these standard metrics that one would look, out, look at are going in the right direction. Uh, having said that, when you look at our yield, that is, if people get accepted to both uh, Northwestern and another top 10 uh, medical school, where do students elect to go? And we lose that battle more often than we win. Uh, I think there are many reasons for that. Uh, we do quite well for competing for students who are co-accepted within the Midwest. But one of the challenges is that our level of funding available for scholarships and financial aid is, is lower than that at many of our competitors. And we have a large class size so that we're spreading the available money over a larger number of students. And we're aware of that challenge. And it's one of our key priorities to raise more money for scholarships and financial aid. But a great medical student class, and of course, this is the pipeline uh, for many of our residency fellowship programs. And ultimately, a lot of our faculty have come from our Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine class. Residency uh, training program, I just wanted to, to summarize for perspective uh, the, the numbers of residents that we have, uh, around 1,000 in total. Uh, you'll recall that this is the year that we'll have a transition from Evanston Northwestern Healthcare. Uh, beginning July the 1st, we'll no longer have residents uh, sponsored at that institution. The ENH residents are shown uh, out here at the end. They're around 200 in total, although a significant fraction of them have always been sponsored by ENH, so internal medicine, pathology, and a few others. Uh, so we're, we're really moving to other institutions, this, this group of residents here. Uh, you see how over, over several years uh, they're being taken either to uh, largely Northwestern Memorial or Children's Memorial Hospital, and there's been a lot of uh, careful analysis to ensure a robust uh, training experience for the residents in these locations. In addition, we've got some new community-based sites that we're quite excited about listed here. Family medicine at, at Norwegian American, some surgery experiences uh, at McNeil, and some new experiences at Stroger Hospital, which may be an area where we'll have an even stronger relationship uh, going forward to really have a differentiated kind of experience for resident uh, training. I did want to uh, review, for those of you who haven't seen it, on YouTube or some other venue, the Inuvention course that we share together with the Kellogg Business School, uh, with the McCormick School of Engineering, and with the Law School. This is a course where students uh, function as a team to come into largely surgical areas to have a surgical mentor. And for a couple of months, 
uh, they study problems and try to come up with novel devices. So I thought we would show a video to highlight uh, what the NU Vention course is all about. So if Northwestern University has created a new way to learn. New Vention is an interdisciplinary program that develops new ideas and products for healthcare and teaches students to become lifelong innovators. We have a team comprised of medical students and engineering students, Kellogg business students and law students working together as a team of eight people, two from each school. They bring very different skills to trying to solve problems that we see in the healthcare system. This course is a real microcosm of having all that talent together. You have engineers coming up with better ideas, the medical team that are looking at, hey, we really need a better way to do this, the patents, the business, all of that stuff behind it. And the thing that was really striking to me out of this is being a doctor and many years away from med school is a fresh set of eyes. What you really want to find out is what are the problems? From observing um, the surgeons and the nurses in the operating room, you really get a sense of what the gaps are in the, in the delivery of service and the patient care. And from that, you start taking a look at what you can do to change it that's practical. It really makes you think of, well, now that I see the, the actual problem, the clinical need, what can I do to change and solve that? From their medical observations, the students develop product prototypes. In the program's first year, the 11 teams came up with a wide range of ideas, including a tool to help neurosurgeons, a disc to control pain, and a new way to control hospital-based infections. The idea that you know, we're not just writing a paper, but we're trying to engineer a solution, we're trying to build something that is gonna actively result in change in the way we take care of our patients. This course came about from student ideas. It says a lot about our students. It says a lot about the faculty that were involved directly in teaching this program, as well as all of our Feinberg clinical faculty who advised these teams, who allowed them to go on rounds, who allowed them into their surgical suites, and really took the time that they don't really have because they really felt that this was something important and it was another dimensional learning. Okay. Newvention does give you an opportunity to collaborate with people. Uh, in a way that you've never done before in specialized fields that you can't do as an undergraduate because of the training. You can become an entrepreneur through this class. The course culminates in a presentation to an advisory board of venture capitalists and leaders in the biomedical industry. Students in this program have been so engaged that well after the course was finished, more than half are continuing to explore real-world opportunities for their products. This went from a learning experience and getting a grade to a passion about being able to prove to yourself as a student that you can build a business based on a need that you helped develop. The amazing thing I think about this institution, the School of Medicine and really Northwestern as a whole, is this place is a, a, an extremely collaborative place and a very supportive place. You can bring in people from industry, you can bring in people from various different walks of life in order to really craft a, a solution to a lot of these different problems. Northwestern University is committed to collaboration and innovation in the classroom and beyond. Newvention is the future of professional education. Okay, thank you. I, I think this really illustrates several things that you'll see happening in the future. First, we're looking at the undergraduate medical curriculum and thinking about how it should be designed for the future. I think this is an example of, of the kind of new uh, learning that students are looking for. It illustrates the cross-campus collaborations with different schools to leverage the assets that we have in other parts of, of the university. And I think it shows the, the linkage between innovation and clinical care and really what academic medical centers are all about in that respect. Uh, we're also expanding our opportunities with a global reach. I'll mention later on the creation of a new Center for Global Health. Uh, you see illustrated here some of the sites for training. In many ways, it's not the number of sites, but the richness of those experiences and the depth of the experience. Uh, we see this as a growing activity going forward. Uh, students and residents and faculty who visit these sites uh, come back changed. I think their approach uh, to medicine going forward and even their careers is often fundamentally different. 
I wanted to go through just a few topic areas, recognizing that we have thousands of faculty and students. It's not possible to highlight uh, each of you. Uh, but I did want to pick out some examples to make real uh, what goes on in the medical school and the academic medical center. And first, I wanted to illustrate one of our MSTP students, uh, Ben Chen. Uh, ben had done research before he came to medical school. Uh, he was inspired because of that experience to join an MD-PhD program. He had done virology research before, and when he came to Northwestern as part of the MSTP program, uh, he decided to explore various vi virology research opportunities and elected the laboratory of Bob Lamb. Some of you may know Bob. He's a Howard Hughes investigator in the department of, of BMBCB on the Evanston campus. Uh, he studies influenza A. It remains a, a huge problem worldwide. I think many of you recognize that a lot more people still die from influenza than from some of the other viruses that get uh, intensive investigation. And his particular project was to examine the biochemistry of, of influenza A by creating virus-like particles that could allow him to study how the virus gets packaged inside the cell and how it, it exits the cell and is, is presented then to the immune system. Uh, these are fundamentally important questions and I think perhaps most importantly uh, convinced Ben, who's up here on the, on the second row, uh, to continue to pursue a research career. He plans to go into pathology and is applying to some of the most competitive pathology uh, departments in the country. It's likely that he'll switch topics from virology research into another uh, domain. That's okay. You get well trained in two different disciplines and you're particularly uh, prepared for a future career uh, in research. Uh, very talented. Uh, this is really one of our, our goals to populate uh, the community with physician scientists. Uh, Juan Carlos Casado is uh, in transplant. I don't think he's here uh, today, but he's really had a huge impact on our, our medical center. Uh, he comes from Colombia and wanted to get uh, a, an additional experience in liver transplant here at Northwestern, since we're one of the leaders in doing uh, liver transplants nationally and in the world. Where his work has taken him, though, is, is to focus on the population of of Hispanics in the Chicago area that haven't had adequate access uh, to the medical system, but transplantation specifically. And he recognized early on that there were many reasons for this, the language barrier being the most obvious, but beyond the language barrier, some of the cultural issues that had to do with decision making and access to the medical center. And very often, not only himself, but his staff would bring the entire family in to talk about the living donor process. He would realize that sometimes it was the grandparent or the parent that was the decision maker in the family and you really needed to have everyone involved in that process. And you can see the numbers for uh, kidney transplants performed here between 2005 before he got started in 2008. And you see the, the rapid increase both at, at NMH and at Children's uh, owing to his impact. I, I think what this reminds us is for everyone in the room, uh, everything that you're doing is making a difference, whether you're on the front lines of clinical care, uh, whether you're studying as part of the next generation and will have a career in medicine or in, or in science, uh, whether you're one of the staff uh, working here to support some of these uh, activities, it is making a difference. And we can't capture all of those in, in my short presentation, but it's very impressive when you hear these individual stories. Ziran Liu, who's also here today at, at the front, uh, joined us uh, two or three years ago. Uh, she's got a very strong uh, background in science, also with, a, with an MD-PhD degree. Uh, she's also switched careers from an area that I know well in developmental biology into transplant uh, medicine. Uh, she had worked uh, with a group in New York that was one of the leaders in, uh, in the immune system and tolerance. Ralph Steinman was one of the collaborators, and they've been interested in how dendritic cells uh, process information to uh, either stimulate the immune system or to induce tolerance. She came here with a KO8 grant, and this is one of the mentored uh, grant awards. Steve Miller uh, was her mentor for this grant and has worked on the nervous system and uh, the immune system. 
And together, they came up with some new approaches to think about how if you induced cell death of splenocytes, for example, that the immune system may uh, respond to that uh, with tolerance. And those preliminary experiments look uh, very promising, actually. And what, what the data shows here are pancreatic islets transplanted underneath the kidney capsule in one of these combined models where immune tolerance has been introduced. And you know this is, is the case, because if you transplant these islets now to a non-tolerized uh, animal, they, they get rejected very quickly. Now, I think many of you realize that the, the holy grail of transplant medicine now is to avoid immunosuppression or, or minimize some of the complications of either the drugs or the rejection process. So uh, this is highly innovative work uh, at the translational cutting edge, and I think, again, illustrates the power of working across some of these disciplines. Uh, Donald Lloyd-Jones in preventive medicine is interested in cardiovascular risk assessment. And he's been deeply involved in the Framingham Heart Study for a number of years. Uh, a number of other large databases are accessible to him. One of the things that, that he's recognized is that the predictions uh, that have traditionally been out there have been somewhat limited in terms of being able to predict those who are either at relatively low risk or high risk because they tend to give 10-year estimates. And what people really need are, are longer, multi-decade uh, estimates, because if you had information that said your 20 or 30-year risk was either low or high, it would really alter your prevention strategies or the level of intensity with which you would want to do screening. So you can see the, the span of activity going on here that goes from the most basic research uh, to epidemiologic research all of which can have a huge impact on how we manage patients and, and on healthcare more broadly. I wanted to also illustrate uh, Dabio Lee, who's also here today up at the front, uh, who's been working in cardiovascular risk assessment but using imaging as a tool. Uh, when he goes to his meetings, he's the go-to guy that people want to talk to to find out how to modify their techniques to get more information. And so you can see that he's one of the shakers and movers in the field, ultimately he would like to have a single method, imaging method, for assessing cardiovascular health by looking at the vasculature, cardiac function, looking at plaques, uh, not only within the heart but throughout the rest of the body. Uh, he's come up with a number of, of methodologies for uh, acquiring uh, information, for uh, minimizing the motion artifacts that you have with the beating heart. Uh, so you, you, can, you can imagine the, the power of this as our uh, detection of, uh, of risk factors improves and non-invasive techniques for being able to look at coronary blood flow or post-ischemia to assess not only uh, damage to the heart but cardiac function. So imaging, whether it's in the cardiovascular area, neuroscience continues to transform the field of medicine. Raja Watramani is another uh, new faculty member in the Department of Neurology. Uh, he's interested in the progenitor cells that give rise to dopamine neurons. Uh, this is a very important topic because of its clinical implications in Parkinson's disease, but I think more broadly the question of, of where are the renewable cells in the body that give rise to more differentiated cells. And while the, the traditional thought about Parkinson's has been could we take uh, stem cells or embryonic stem cells and implant them? And there have been uh, trials along those lines that, that may ultimately be very promising. Another idea is to think about the endogenous stem cells that may reside there. And what are the growth factors that would induce uh, their regeneration or maybe delay uh, the loss of those cells? And studying those native populations, uh, their origins, how they migrate, how they differentiate, is also a very powerful uh, part of what's a growing team at Northwestern focused on Parkinson's disease, raising, ranging from uh, gene delivery to stem cell biology uh, to drug therapy to signaling and even clinical trials uh, that have been collaborative efforts between uh, neurology and physiology and neurobiology physiology as part of our growing neuroscience enterprise. I also wanted to highlight uh, the work of Shiano Gold, who's uh, a staff member in the Cancer Center. Uh, he's a cancer survivor himself. 
and decided to get involved in some of the clinical trials that were going on in the GI arm of the cancer center. And he's, he's involved in the process of, of enrolling and monitoring patients as they go through various clinical trials in the cancer center. And I think he relates to them very strongly as a cancer center, as a cancer survivor himself. And he also uh, is a strong believer, of course, in the impact of, of clinical research uh, as it provides new knowledge and how we manage cancer patients going forward. And it really underscores the impact that everybody has uh, in our medical center. It's not just the physicians, it's not just the nurses, it's everybody who's part of our healthcare team. Let me highlight just a few uh, things with our clinical partners. Uh, first, to go through some of the US News and World Report uh, rankings that relate to Northwestern Memorial Hospital. I've, I've just uh, illustrated representative examples of some of our leading departments comparing uh, 2007 and 2008. And you can see that our neurology, neurosurgery, neuroscience uh, team has not only been highly ranked, but is, is moving up in the rankings. Uh, you can imagine that if you look at the groups above them, uh, you know, they're all extremely talented, well-known uh, departments. So it's going to be heavy lifting uh, going forward, but we certainly should be proud of this group because they've come up a lot over the last five to 10 years. You see some of the other specialty areas listed here, and, and the trend is for people uh, to be moving up. Uh, urology is an aberration. They'll be higher next year. They bounce, they bounce up and down. We have a tremendous urology team, and we should be uh, proud, uh, whether 17 or 20. Uh, the, the biggest jump here is arguably in, in the cardiac and uh, cardiovascular uh, surgery area, and I think we also can anticipate uh, rapid movement upward with our women's health program with the opening of Prentice Women's Hospital, but also the rapid expansion of research in obstetrics and gynecology. The Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago has been ranked number one for 18 consecutive years. Uh, it's not even clear where number two is. They're so far ahead. It's, uh, I, I attended their research board meeting today. They've got a bold new plan. Uh, to launch research that goes from the most basic uh, to, to clinical trials. Uh, in JAMA, uh, recently Todd Koikens worked not only on the creation of these robotic devices that are attached to the chest wall, uh, which was a huge accomplishment in itself, but now looking at how people adapt to these devices over time and begin to, to use them more effectively is an example of how rapidly uh, this work is progressing. Uh, they're the only hospital that's got model systems center designations in these three major areas. Of course, the biggest news about children's, as I mentioned before, is the fact that they're moving to Streeterville on time. Looks like the, the budget is going to support that move completely. Uh, by 2012, as you, as you look out over the site, the construction is happening quickly. And we're, we're clearly now moving into the programmatic phase to think about how to join the clinical programs as they're more physically proximate, as well as the research programs. I just wanted to mention, I, I saw uh, Mary walking in, the Xenobase uh, bioinformatics system that, that she brought uh, to Children's Hospital uh, from a Grand Rapids group. It's one of these uh, informatics systems that can mine uh, databases. And so it's being piloted out at Children's. It may be something that we would adopt more broadly for the electronic data warehouse. The Jesse Brown Hospital uh, new bed tower has been completed. It's a green medical center, uh, new operating rooms, new outpatient facilities. So we see the rejuvenation of the VA as part of this thriving collaboration between former Lakeside and, and Westside uh, VA hospitals and an increasing number of our faculty getting involved in the VA. I just wanted to mention uh, briefly the, the planning processes that you've heard about in other venues the Great Academic Medical Center, and One Northwestern. Just to, to highlight the, the three uh, primary areas for the Great Academic Medical Center, delivering exceptional care, advancing medical science, and developing people, culture, and resources, one might reframe this in some ways as, what is the Northwestern brand experience when you come here for clinical care? We want to set the expectations very high for what it means to get clinical care at Northwestern, not only in the level of decision making and access to clinical care, but the patient experience that's associated with that. 
we know the buzz around Northwestern for recruiting talent, either as, as scientists or as students, that's helping to advance the medical science. Again, it's, it's the reputational value of what's going on here. And whether it's the K08 kind of example that I gave before, or some of the other mentoring programs that we have within our departments and centers, to be able to develop the people is our most important asset and resource. Ultimately, the goal of this planning process is to be a top 10 hospital and a top 10 medical school by 2020. And we've listed here the limited examples of places that are top 10 in both of those categories. You can see that it's a elite company. Uh, it's an ambitious set of goals. We think we can get there. One Northwestern is also uh, thriving in its planning process. Uh, many of you have heard about this in, in other venues. The idea is to take better advantage of the full set of assets available in a broad university. And I've tried to highlight some of those in my presentation today. Uh, we should underscore the fact that, that NUCATS got funded last year as part of the CTSA and provides a critical infrastructure piece for moving translational research, not only at the medical school, but throughout the rest of the university. And linked to other uh, such infrastructure pieces like IBNAM, Cells to Society, the Cancer Center. I also wanted to highlight a couple of our new chairs, both, both here today. John Chernansky, who's uh, leading the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and has brought a great new vision for this exciting field. Uh, John talks about the ability to be able to uh, analyze psychiatric illness at earlier and earlier stages so that we can not only uh, treat them once they've become fully manifest, but be able to intervene, hopefully, at, at earlier stages to develop and utilize more effective drugs and therapies at earlier stages. A great example of where uh, research and training will ultimately impact our clinical care. And Doug Vaughn, uh, who's joined us in, as the leader of the Department of Medicine, uh, the largest department in the university, with a bold new vision for expanding the role of the department throughout the medical center, uh, recruiting a lot of new uh, leaders into those divisions, and uh, really embracing the idea of interdisciplinary research and clinical care, and has, within a short period of year, become a key institutional leader. Uh, Doug gave a fantastic presentation to the hospital board uh, earlier this week. We have a number of, of new institutes and centers. Uh, these are really the bridges that connect up the different departments, including departments outside the medical school. Uh, some of you may have attended uh, Lou Landsberg's presentation uh, in this room for the Northwestern Comprehensive Center on Obesity. And we have one of the domain dinners in the Evanston campus next week to highlight this uh, topic to help bridge it to the rest of the university. Uh, this year, we launched the Brain Tumor Institute that's co-chaired by Jim Chandler and, and Jeff Razor from neurosurgery and, and neurology, recognizing this important problem that, again, can bring, bring multiple disciplines uh, to tackle what's been a challenging uh, clinical problem uh, to understand the basic science, to come up with new therapies, and ultimately impact uh, the outcomes. I'll soon be announcing more formally the Center for Global Health to be directed by Rob Murphy, uh, who's been engaged in this topic uh, for many years, particularly on the HIV uh, AIDS side, and has uh, led our initiatives for HIV research in Africa. Uh, there's just huge interest in this area, and we want to link not only uh, research projects in, in global health uh, to one another, and to the rest of the university, but to provide some training experiences uh, for students and faculty in some of these settings. We'll also be uh, announcing the, the Center for Transplant Medicine to be directed by Mike Abacassis. Uh, you can see from some of the vignettes that I presented around immunology and transplant medicine what an exciting area this is. I mean, transplant has been an area where there have been multiple Nobel Prizes over the last few decades. It's uh, the first phase, arguably, of, of regenerative medicine, whether it's bone marrow transplants or organ replacement. We'd like to be able to think about this 
long term in, in the sense of how do we regenerate organs, if not endogenously, in vitro, to help with the fact that, that ultimately we've got a shortage of organs. And so to be able to use regenerative medicine uh, to go after organ regeneration would be uh, a fabulous uh, new set of tools. Uh, Teresa Woodruff's group working in, in oncofertility has been thinking about this uh, in terms of the ovarian follicle, if you want to think about that as a, as a small organ. And they're having really great success. It's a terrific proof of principle, I think, that a collaboration between uh, faculty and OBGYN and material science can come up with some novel strategies for uh, recreating successful follicle development in vitro. In this case, to be able to replace reproduction in women that have gone through chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So let me close then with the theme that I presented last week and I think is, is cap last year and is captured again this year, alignment, innovation, and impact. I think are guiding principles that we can use to think about our academic medical center. The alignment of institutions one to the other, the alignment of departments across the university is critically important. So we don't always have to recruit new people within a very specific domain to create synergy. Sometimes they already exist somewhere within our institutions and we just need to identify who they are, the skills that they can bring to a problem, and then how do we make that connection. So alignment, although in small print, is maybe one of the more important aspects of this. Innovation needs to be part of our culture. Uh, we see it in the individual scientists. I also wanted to underscore it with inuvention as part of the training experience where the, the students want to be creative. They want to be part of an innovative environment. And I think that kind of format can be re recreated in some other domains. And impact, I think, is, is a metric and a way of thinking that we can use, whether it's in clinical care, and basic research and clinical research and education or how we affect our communities. Ultimately, we need to always keep our eye on how much impact are we having? Are we using our time and our resources in the most effective way? So I'll close with that. Again, I, I thank you for your attention, but most importantly, I thank you for what you bring to this medical center. Uh, all of you make such important contributions in, in each of our domains. So we've got some microphones that are out at the sides, given the size of the room. Uh, we would encourage you, if you have some comments or questions, to walk over to the microphones. Yes, Mary Hendricks is going to break the ice. Larry, I'm going to ask you how you'd like to take advantage of the $10 billion extra dollars that's going to be available at the NIH. Do you have a strategic plan for one Northwestern? So Mary refers to the fact that uh, Arlen Specter almost single-handedly got $10 billion added to the stimulus bill and was one of the three Republicans who, who voted for the stimulus plan. Uh, this is an incredible boon for researchers on the one hand. Uh, the folks at NIH are very worried about this because a $10 billion bolus that has to be spent within two years is A, a logistical problem for them to solve, and B, they're worried about the ramp up, you know, followed by what doesn't happen after a ramp up. And so I think there are a couple of, of possible solutions. And I was at a meeting this weekend with Francis Collins and uh, some of the other people who are tightly associated with, uh, with the NIH, Betsy Nabel. Uh, the way they're thinking about it, so I think this is pretty close to the ground, uh, they want to spend the money on things that, where the money can be spent quickly. It doesn't require a huge amount of process, and there won't be a lot of legacy effect if they're not able to sustain it. Now, their first choice is to lobby that this $10 billion infusion uh, should be addictive, and, and we should convince the Congress that the money is well spent and that investing in research has a two and a half fold payback uh, to the economy, but also uh, a more indirect payback in terms of the health of, of uh, the population. So they're going to be looking for equipment, 
supplements to grants that pre-exist, uh, grants that were close to the pay line that have already been reviewed, uh, so they'll go ahead and get funded quickly. And they claimed that this was going to be a very transparent process uh, where you know, the RFAs will come out, grants go in, get reviewed, and it'll be clear where the, where the money you know, got sent back and why. Uh, having heard all of that, what I would encourage you to do is, first of all, call your program officer because it's all going to be managed locally. The, the money's already been allocated out to the institutes. It's like a pie where they divided it up proportionately to what their budget was before. And I think that program officer can give you some guidance as to RFAs they plan to put out. If you've already got a grant, could a supplement go in? Uh, is equipment part of the package and is a piece of equipment that you're considering something that might be uh, relevant? And beyond that, uh, institutionally, we're certainly thinking about large capital projects for uh, some of the animal renovation that we've been struggling uh, to come up with the money for. There's a tower footprint adjacent to this building that we would like to be able to uh, accelerate the progress on as quickly as possible. And we certainly will put in applications uh, for all of those things. So uh, thanks for asking about that. Uh, it's, it's a key time, I think, to put an application in if you can make a case because it, we, we don't know what's going to come after this, but it could be a bit of a drought afterwards. Okay, well, big audience, again, I thank you for coming. We're going to have a reception outside. I look forward to seeing you there. <laughs>